All right, everyone, this is part two of the 8-1 lecture. Now we're going to look at the actual adult structures of the anterior abdominal wall. Uh, so here is your kind of clinical uh, quadrants that help you identify uh, things like abdominal pain uh, within a patient. Once we get to discussing referred pain and things like that, that'll help us understand uh, the different intra-abdominal uh, conditions that can occur and how we identify those. Uh, but right now, uh, just to understand that the abdominal wall is the portion inferior to the costal margin uh, and to the pelvic brim. Uh, so the, we can also uh, differentiate these structures um, based on their depth. So, of course, we're discussing the peripheral anatomy right now, the musculoskeletal anatomy. Uh, so, we're talking about peripheral structures, but within the body, there are also visceral structures, which we'll discuss in the next uh, semester worth of lectures. And so, the visceral structures are located deep to the body walls. You can see the, in the different visceral cavities identified in this structure here. So there's a cranial, thoracic, abdominal, and pelvic visceral cavities. So the ventral body wall is just the uh, dermal, muscular, uh, fascial portion that separates the outside world from the visceral cavities. And then, of course, there's a dorsal body wall as well. <clears throat> so now let's talk about the layers of the abdominal wall. So first, of course, the skin uh, is the uh, most external layer of the body wall. And as soon as we remove that, we see the dermis as well as a layer of fatty superficial fascia. So some dude uh, 250 years ago named Camper uh, got his name, uh, got this uh, fatty layer of fascia named after him. So we call that layer Camper's fascia. Uh, <clears throat> deep to Camper's fascia, we are going to see a membranous layer of fascia. That's called Scarpa's fascia. So you can see in this actual photograph uh, some of these different layers. Uh, we'll notice that the abdominal rectus muscles are actually enclosed in a sheath of fascia, an aponeurotic sheath. So we'll talk more about all of these sheaths and layers as we continue going deep. But first, uh, let's uh, be sure we identify these different layers of fascia and identify how they differ from each other. So we already talked about the fatty layer, Camper's fascia, which is found throughout the anterior abdominal wall. Deep to that is scarpus fascia, as I already mentioned, so that's the membranous layer. That membranous layer is continuous onto the thorax as well as over the pelvis and perineum. When that layer of fascia, the membranous layer of superficial fascia, uh, when we move to a different region of the body, it gets a different name. So over the um, reproductive organs, the creative organs, uh, of the perineum, uh, we uh, name that fascia Darto's fascia. And over the uh, perineum, uh, outside of the creative organs, we name that fascia Collie's fascia. So again, these were just dudes 200 years ago or so, uh, 250 years ago, that uh, were um, renowned for their anatomical skills. And so, they uh, fortunately or unfortunately got a layer of fascia in the perineum named after them. It's not uh, my thing. If, if you guys uh, watching this video ever identify a layer of whatever, a new structure over the male creative organs, it's okay. You don't have to name it after me. But anyway, these layers have a clinical importance and that is in the extravasation of urine uh, that we see on this slide. This can also uh, res be the result of a similar situation with the extravasation of blood, but usually um, uh, the more common is uh, urine. So the urethra in the region about the bulb of the penis, the base of the penis in the male, uh, that can get damaged because of its uh, you know, external location. 
And if that urethra gets damaged and disrupted, it can lead to the leakage of urine between these layers of fascia. So we can see here in this slide how that uh, extravasation of urine is occurring and traveling throughout the perineal region around the creative organs of the male as well as up into the abdominal wall region. That's because this layer of fascia is continuous throughout those different areas. It's just named something different. Uh, so uh, this slide also gives you a good understanding of where those names uh, change, as well as where different layers of more uh, of deeper uh, fascias uh, begin and end. Uh, so take a quick look at that slide and moving on. So here in these next few slides, we have the musculature, uh, including the uh, movements of that musculature. So take a look at these, of course, the rectus abdominis uh, muscle deep to this rectus sheath. Uh, so uh, that will have implications soon, but try to understand the uh, contraction of the muscles that's required for different trunk movements. For instance, in order to laterally flex the trunk or to bend the trunk to the side, you need to uh, ipsilaterally contract both the external and internal abdominal oblique muscles. Uh, if those muscles on the same side of the body are contracted, then the trunk will bend. If the external and internal abdominal obliques are contracted on the uh, contralateral sides, that will result in trunk rotation. Uh, so you can see those examples here. Uh, so go through those in your studies and understand those. So here on this slide, we have removed the anterior rectus sheath so we can see the individual bellies of rectus abdominis uh, which are connected by these tendinous intersections. Uh, so the innervation of these muscles is via the segmental nerves, so via the intercostal nerves and the subcostal nerve below the 12th rib. Uh, so not much uh, interesting going on there, not really individually named nerves. Uh, we also have a small muscle called pyramidalis, which attaches to the linea alba, this uh, long uh, fascial line straight down the middle of the abdominal wall. And so the py pyramidalis will tense that, uh, that line. Uh, moving on to the next slide, if it will ever move for me. So here we get into those uh, oblique muscles. We can see uh, the different layers in this slide representing the different oblique muscles. First comes the external abdominal oblique, then the internal abdominal oblique, and finally transversus abdominis. And each one of these muscles has a very different and distinct orientation and range uh, at which you'll find it. So, the external abdominal oblique is found higher up and attaches to the ribs. The internal oblique attaches to the pelvis, so is lower, and its fibers are at a 90 degree angle to the external oblique muscles. And then finally, transversus abdominis is mostly horizontal, found throughout the anterior abdominal wall. <clears throat> so again, uh, here another slide emphasizing the rotation of these uh, of the trunk with activation of these different muscles and showing you how the vectors the orientations of these muscle fibers result in that rotation <clears throat> so the rule of thumb is that uh, when you're contralaterally uh, uh, contracting the external and internal oblique the trunk is going to rotate toward the, the, uh, toward the internal abdominal oblique. So for instance, if um, I am contracting my right internal abdominal oblique and my left external abdominal oblique, I'm going to rotate to the right. Uh, so just keep that rule in mind. It's whatever side the internal oblique is located on that the rotation will turn toward. <clears throat> So here now we have removed the rectus abdominis muscles and we can see the posterior rectus sheath, 
which is this aponeurosis formed by uh, the uh, oblique muscles. <clears throat> the uh, rectus abdominis will pierce through that rectus sheath at this little pouch, uh, like a kangaroo pouch, uh, at a location called the arcuate line. So this, is a, this arcuate line is a landmark. It's a thickening of that uh, fascial, those fascial fibers that you can actually see uh, in the dissected cadaver. And this forms a landmark for um, uh, uh, different structures and for a different orientation of the structures of the anterior abdominal wall. So here, when, when we're talking about regions above the arcuate line, so regions above the arcuate line, uh, then we're gonna have a different orientation than regions below the arcuate line. So here above the arcuate line, you can see this is the order uh, in which you'll find the structures of the abdominal wall. And uh, this slide is animated showing you um, those different structures color-coded and where they come, where you can find them. Uh, so this dark line here represents the, the um, rectus abdominis muscle. So the anterior rectus sheath uh, above the arcuate line is composed of the aponeuroses, of the external and internal abdominal oblique muscles. The posterior rectus sheath above the arcuate line is composed of portions of the aponeuroses of the internal and transversus aponeuroses. So above the arcuate line, the internal abdominal oblique aponeurosis actually divides and encompasses both sides of the rectus abdominis muscle. Then behind uh, the posterior rectus sheath, you have the transversalis fascia and finally the parietal layer of peritoneum. Peritoneum being the connective tissue that surrounds the inside of the abdominal cavity. Now, this slide is talking about below the arcuate line, inferior to the arcuate line. So here, uh, because the rectus abdominis muscles are going deep to the anterior rectus sheath, the structures behind rectus abdominis are much more limited. So here we can see we've got still campers and scarpus fascia. The anterior rectus sheath is made up of the aponeuroses of all of the uh, abdominal rotator muscles, the external, internal, and transversus abdominis muscles. So all of those aponeuroses below the arcuate line contribute to the anterior rectus sheath. Then when we go behind deep to the rectus abdominis muscle indicated by this black line, then we have only two layers, the transversalis fascia and the peritoneum, the parietal layer of peritoneum, as you can see here on this slide. So that's it for this uh, part of the abdominal wall lecture.